Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 356, a case study, mysterious muscle wasting in a 62-year-old woman. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, medical director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. So you were talking to me the other day about an interesting case that you had, uh, a female, 62 years old, uh, who... About 5'1", and I don't know, weighs what, 110? 110 at the most. Mm -hmm. And she has been to multiple doctors because she has concerns about feeling tired and exhausted all the time. Uh, And now she has a whole litany of complaints that Mm -hmm. you want to talk about. And so far, pretty typical situation. You hear that all the time in Mm -hmm. people in that age bracket that Mm -hmm. come in, both men and women. And they present with this list of symptoms that were are on mm-hmm. the checklist and she agreed with that list of symptoms mm-hmm. for her. Uh, and so then you both agreed that pellets would be a good thing. And you started with testosterone, mm-hmm. no estrogen because she had issues about, she had family concerns. history of breast cancer and she was worried. So I accepted her worry. And then we, so we'll just start with, see the if we could just do without it. But so then she came back in for her normal checkup four months mm-hmm. later and didn't feel any better, felt that nothing was happening. Mm-hmm. So you decided on another round of testosterone, and this time you added estrogen, and you also treated a couple of other hormones that you had not treated the first time. I just increased the testosterone dose, and I not drastically high, but high for her body size, uh-huh. and gave her estrogen. Estrogen. So, but so I want to describe the symptoms Walk first before symptoms. we go okay. through the rest, because but, well, the point I was wanting to make is. At this point, it's still a pretty typical case presentation. Yeah, it could be. But after the second time and the third time, you start to see things that you don't see. And right. now it's a case study that we want to get into. Right. But let's let's do the initial setup. What because, were the symptoms you saw the first so, time? So the first time she came in, she said, I am so tired. That's very common with low testosterone. She said, I my muscles wasting. And she said, she said, look here, all my skin is coming down and She's my muscle like and my muscles gone and she right. did she had these little tiny little arms and she had skin hanging down with lots of that creepy stuff all happening but she was she was skinny mm-hmm. but she looked like she had muscle wasting she, she looked, looked like anorexic yeah she looked kind of anorexic she kind of her face was really drawn her skin was really thin now it's not like i haven't seen this before from just low testosterone right so i thought well <clears throat> What's your exercise program? She says, well, I exercise every day and I get on the treadmill or on the bike or on the elliptical. And I know that she has exercised so much that she's damaged the cartilage in her knees. She could use knee replacements, but she she's afraid that she won't heal, which is a, a, for her is a really reasonable fear, but she continues to exercise. I didn't really talk to her about the duration of exercise at that point. She told me that she ate three meals a day and it because I talk about diet, because if you don't give somebody a lot of protein, they can't make good skin or tight skin, and they can't make muscles. I mean, I eat a lot of protein. In general, that's necessary for testosterone to work. So we talked about her diet. She also said that um, she had really bad hot flashes, and her lab confirmed that her FSH and LH were out, out of the park. Uh-huh. She also couldn't sleep, but... Now it had gotten so bad, which is what probably pushed her into coming to see me, that her her legs felt weak. So even when she was walking, her coordination wasn't great. Her 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 legs felt weak, and her legs didn't have calf muscles like a runner. She didn't have thigh muscles. She just looked really tiny and straight, and her skin was hanging off her legs too. So she had waited so long. I think this had been going on a long time, but she waited till she was just so miserable. So she has all these symptoms, but what she's telling you is she exercises every day. Mm -hmm. She eats responsibly three meals a day, Mm -hmm. uh, drinks moderately, Mm -hmm. and something is just wrong. 
but I hear that all the time. Right. I know. And so I thought she, she would be like 90% of my other patients, women who mm -hmm. just need their testosterone, which then stimulates growth hormone, which then gives them muscle and skin tone and they lose fat. She didn't need to lose fat. She was very thin. Um, but it also, she was also depressed and on several different antidepressants. Okay. So what you need to know if you're on several antidepressants is yes, testosterone can help depression, but being on more than one antidepressant or certain antidepressants can cause you to have more sexual symptoms, meaning no libido right. and, and poor uh, orgasms. And she had no libido and no orgasm. She was miserable in that area. And so and was it her... could just be the antidepressants. Yeah, it, it they, could have they just often, been that. Many of them block those. But testosterone, low testosterone plus an antidepressant right. makes that very difficult. So we discussed that and that that may still be a problem after pellets because it diminishes. You don't get that big, big libido if you're on antidepressants. Hmm. You get some. You get enough to be almost normal. But sometimes you don't need the antidepressants afterwards. You get enough afterwards. to be close to responsive, but right. you are going to get enough to have... To be like wildly initiating. Exactly. Or wear, you know, wearing the wearing the little the apron, look. Yeah. the apron with nothing under it to greet your husband, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, you get that with testosterone, do you? You can. I've heard lots of good stories. <laughs> it comes with an apron. Yeah. <laughs> no. Sadly, our kid doesn't, but that's a good idea. Yeah. And nothing else. Yeah. yeah so... So when she came in the second time, her I, and her labs all looked like low testosterone um, at the first visit, but she also had really high LDL, that's high high bad cholesterol, which is kind of unusual, and uh, she, but not unheard of. But she also had a really low growth hormone, really low, like eighty, um, and her. Uh, a lot of her uh, liver up functions were abnormal. She also had pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia is means that you have low B12, and either you're not absorbing B12, which comes in deep green leafy vegetables. A lot of you have to have a lot of vegetables, but there's a lot of it in liver and in red meat. So I talked to her about that, and she said, "Well, I'm taking B12." Another doctor saw that, told me to take B12. So. I thought she was in the middle of treatment, mm -hmm. okay? So when she came back the second time, she's like, I got nothing. I never hear that <laughs> unless there's some other problem brewing. She's, I got nothing. This eye, and she did look the same. She didn't, usually patients look different when they come back after testosterone in four months. Mm -hmm. she, she just, she looked exactly the same, just as tired. She wasn't sleeping. She got really none of the effects of the testosterone, which was, unusual for me. Right. And I started talking to her at that time about her exercise and her lifestyle. I didn't really talk to her about a specific diet, but I talked to her about how much she exercised. And cause she's like, I exercise all the time. Well, how much? Yeah. Well, two hours every day on the treadmill or the elliptical or on the bike every day. And she's this tiny little thing with really no muscle. So that, that really was concerning to me because she should have muscle. And so I'm thinking some kind of neurologic disease. And at the same time, she's seeing two or three other doctors. Right. And I said, you know, you need to stop exercising for a while. You need to give your body a break because it's very possible. We've talked about this before to over exercise. So if you over exercise, you don't give your body a chance to make muscle. You just break it down, break it down, break it down. Mm -hmm. And so it can't come, it doesn't have time to come back and make more. And testosterone makes you make more muscle. So you have to give it some time to work, right? So I told her that you need to stop doing it. She goes, oh yeah, my other three doctors told me that too. And then I'm thinking, what else did they tell you? But, mm -hmm. and I asked her, she said, oh, nothing, just that I should, but I'm still doing it. She, it makes her feel good. She's addicted. She's addicted to exercise. Right. And she probably has what's called a, a dysmorphic uh, body image. Yes. And you're, you're the, you're the king of those patients. <laughs> so you can explain what that is. Girls that are anorexic can go into treatment facilities, boys occasionally, but typically you, you get anorexic boys as a precursor to like a cancer issue. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but anorexic girls will, will look like concentration camp victims. You stand them in front of a mirror in skimpy little <clears throat> outfits so they can see their entire body. And you see bones. You can count their ribs from 20 feet mm -hmm. away. They see fat accumulations. Oh, I need to work on fat around this hip mm -hmm. and I've got fat up here and I've got fat there. They do not see accurately what everybody else sees when they look at them. Mm -hmm. And that's a dysmorphic body. Okay. When, when you uh, don't accurately see what you look like, you have a negative perception mm -hmm. and you aggressively try to correct what you think you see. And so a lot of times hospitals have to be really careful when you check a girl into a treatment center uh, for anorexia that they don't like sneak out in the middle of the night in the stairwell and exercise because a lot of these treatment yeah, centers, they, do. They, they force them to eat the food. <clears throat> they make right. them eat regular meal. They watch them. They count them out. They'll, anorexic girls will stir the food around on the plate and talk. And play with it. Down and play with it. And, and so people who aren't paying attention don't realize they're not actually eating it. Mm -hmm. And then they get up and they say, well, I've had plenty. I'm, you know, but <clears throat> I'm full. I'm full. Uh, and they obsess on calories. They cook elaborate meals for their families and some mm -hmm. really good cooks, but they don't ever eat anything. And they say, oh, I ate as I was cooking. You know the, what, the, what the French call the cook's more, the chef's more. Right, and this patient does that. Yes. She said she's a Good, really good cook meals. and yes. she does all these ethnic dinners and she's... Yeah. But by the time to put it on the table, right. she's already full because she's been tasting and testing and preparing. But she hasn't and, really... And, but she hadn't done that. Yeah. But she will tell you that she has, and she may even believe that she mm -hmm. has. Uh, but she's not experiencing hunger. So mm -hmm. she's depleting and exhausting her body and where she, she's worn off all the fat and now she's wearing off all the muscles mm -hmm. and now she's in pain mm -hmm. and she's not able to do the things and she's exhausted that she wants <clears throat> to do. But the willpower of the addiction is so strong that she's still doing two hours of exercise every day. And the things that you're telling her not to do mm -hmm. as a physician, she's doing so. My recommendation would be she needs some pretty serious counseling. Well, I think she does too, but whether she gets it right. or not, she hasn't listened to the last three doctors. She has, and after right. the second visit, it turns out she didn't listen to me either. She's still exercising on right. the third visit. And the second visit, she gave me a little clue. She said, uh, I asked her about drinking and she said, well, yeah, I have a glass of wine every night. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound that bad. So, I mean, I, I kind of, of I try, you, I can only work off what you tell me. But it's like, like that joke though, you know, my doctor told me I could only have one glass of yes, wine a day. So I had to get a new glass. Uh, yeah. Know. A huge glass. Yeah. So, so she's, so I'm kind of in this, I'm trusting her to tell me the truth. Right. right. Well, you have I to. have to. Yeah. So, so then I said, it's really important that you stop exercising for a week and then go to like every other day and then right. decrease the time you exercise. It's right. very important. You're not going to make muscle and it, your muscles will hurt because your testosterone is trying to make muscle, trying to build muscle. It has nothing to work with. Well, you would want to have that conversation with her. We need to stop damaging your muscles. We need to give them a break and, and then ease <clears throat> back into appropriate exercise. Mm -hmm. So you're asking her questions about what do you do in terms of exercise, mm -hmm. how long, how intense, aerobic or resistance or what have you. You also need to get data-based information on how she eats. What well, that's what eat. I did on the third visit. I okay. said, finally, nothing's better. Your B12, your pernicious anemia is bad. We, ha we are not, we haven't fixed you and there's something else going on. So my first, you know, I just said, okay, so just tell me everything you Keep eat a food diary. in a day. Yeah. No, I just, I just asked her right there. Tell me what you ate yesterday. Mm -hmm. She says, well, for breakfast, I have a small bowl of cereal and a piece of fruit. With skim milk. Right. Yeah. They don't have real milk. Right. So skim milk. And then at lunch, I have one of those little salads, 220 calories. Okay. So probably breakfast was less than 200. Yeah. Her piece of fruit was probably a blackberry or a blueberry. Well, I didn't ask that part. I know, but, but it doesn't matter. She's eating so little. And then right. at dinner, I eat a little bit of meat and a salad and some vegetables. I said, well, you've just had 800 calories basically. And you have worn off 800 calories with your exercise. Right. So it's no wonder that you can't You're build starving. muscle. You're starving. Right. And that's why they call it anorexia, the wasting disease. You are wasting away. She, she looks literally 15 years older than she is. Yeah. So, and, and that's what it does to you when you're a uh, anorexic as at an older age, you look old, 
when you're young and you're an anorexic, you just look really sick, like you're gonna die, like you have cancer or something. But that's the end point. So yeah. I'm really concerned yeah. with this patient's following my direction. She's gonna resist it. And she's and gonna then, lie to you. And then I said, How much so how much wine do you actually drink a night? Mm -hmm. And she said, I drink a bottle by myself and sometimes a couple of whatever gin and tonics, vodka, vodka tonics. So that's all her calories. Right. Which are terrible calories that's, and that's a thousand calories a day, that much wine and, and a gin and tonic. But there's no muscle building factor there. It's all no. it's all fat. She can make yeah. fat. Yeah. But she can't because she's still she's burning, it all, burning it all off. So the other thing was um, that explains her pernicious anemia. So pernicious anemia is really big red blood cells that carry oxygen, but they can't get into your capillaries because they're too big. So you get hypoxic. So your extremities get hypoxic. So hypoxia leads to death of tissues. Mm -hmm. So we've been giving her B12 and she's drinking it away. Mm -hmm. And that's why her muscles aren't working and they're... They're dying. Now she can't even, she can't even, she can get on a treadmill or on a bike, but now she really has trouble like with her balance going up and down stairs. Right. She, her muscle is so, it is, is so atrophied. So we have, wow. we, so now on, so you always have to get to the bottom of this. If, if we see something that is not typical testosterone loss, typical aging, then we have to get to what is it then? She may have some other neurologic issue. She hasn't been to that doctor yet. She's been to several others. and But she hasn't followed any direction, so I'm not exactly sure what the next step is. The next, so, the next step from my perspective would be uh, a confrontation with family support. Intervention. Uh, an intervention to say you have a significant issue that is destroying your health and your body. And we need to have monitors and watchers to make sure she's eating, make sure she's limiting her exercise. She needs some therapy to try to get to the bottom of the addiction, mm -hmm. whatever's driving that and however to change it. But right now she does not see it. She won't acknowledge it. She's, uh, it is stronger than any other awareness that she has, the need to exercise and the need to not eat. I think she's bored. She's retired, so she's bored. And Maybe. I think this took over when she became born. And that's what happens with addictions. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds to me <clears throat> like a pretty aggressive addiction that is leading to the wasting disease. And so her family needs to be told that's what we mm -hmm. think is, we're looking at and encourage them to go to somebody that knows what they're doing to treat those eating disorders. So And drinking. So this is... This it's all is, part of it. These are some of the problems that when you're trying to make people healthy that you run into right. when your normal, pro your normal protocol that makes people who don't have some other illness mm -hmm. well and healthy, then this, when it's not working, you have to look for something else. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't even know what asked me, what, what caused me to ask her like every detail of her diet. Cause well, you usually I would mm -hmm. say, take this diary, go home, right. write down, everything down, but she wouldn't have done it. Right. It would have wasted another oh, four months right. because in general, people who have that problem won't give you a diary of what they eat mm -hmm. or how much they exercise. Right. So, so in this case, we always have to be thinking about those things. If you have family members who have gone for treatment in any kind of preventive medicine or treatment to make more muscle and they are getting that treatment and they're losing muscle, we have to look for something else. So I have a question. In my business, we have what's called a duty to warn. We have a legal and ethical responsibility to tell someone else mm -hmm. if a patient that we have is suicidal mm -hmm. or is, is doing something that, that puts their life in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have that obligation? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not imminent danger. Okay. This is danger down the line, and mm -hmm. HIPAA prevents us from talking. You have patient confidentiality. Right. Without so, permission. So unless they give me permission talk to, to talk to their husband. family members, right. I can't. Yes. Now I have permission to talk to this person's husband. Well, that's the next move. You have, you have that permission, then you need to talk to him. So that's my next move, right. and that's one of those conversations you don't want to have. Right. It's because hard. he's living with it. He so he he may also have a distorted view. I mean, he's working. Yeah. I assume still he's working. very thin. And he's thin, and you know they're both into living a healthy life. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to recognize that crossover line from being really healthy. Mm -hmm. 
to being unhealthy as a result of trying to be healthy. Well, she was proud of herself for eating 220, 220 calories per meal three times a day. She thought that I would that's, think that was that's, great. That's a classic anorexic pride. Yeah. You know, and, and accomplishment. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that... It's about that the willpower. I have willpower over this and complete control over my calorie intake, no matter what pressure I'm under. It's the one area in my life that I have control over. That and, and exercise. And that's on. why she won't stop yeah, exercising. Exactly. I mean, somebody who has no... Um, She's going to have knee problems? She has knee problems. Okay. So somebody who has no uh, cartilage in their knees who still runs, mm -hmm. that's the most painful thing. Bone on bone pain is really painful and they still run. Yeah. That's an obsession and it's not a healthy one. So this is a case study of an unusual circumstance and it's like a detective novel in that you finally get to what you think is driving it mm -hmm. and then the next step is literally out of your control. You can have a conversation with her husband mm -hmm. or with her and her husband mm -hmm. in which you lay these things out and say, this is what I see. These are my concerns mm -hmm. and this is why she's not getting any better and why she's still on a doctor hunt to find a doctor that will have the, the right answer that mm -hmm. won't require her to change her behavior. She wants you to fix her without changing her behavior. Mm -hmm. And so they may not come back after that, mm -hmm. but you've done I mean, your duty. If you lay that out and mm -hmm. say, here is what you are looking at. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do this, here's what will happen. And I guess I would have picked this up faster on a young person because I think of anorexia as a young, as a young disease. It but, typically is. But yeah. honestly, when I was growing up, most of us were, most of us were anorexics because. Uh, but see, I don't, I don't know. Twiggy at this point was the, the model. Twiggy was a model. Yeah. I, I don't know at this point that the issue is anorexia as, as the underlying cause. Mm -hmm. It's a secondary payout. Mm -hmm. the, the issue has to do with something else, but it, it's become an addiction and an obsession. Mm -hmm. And the secondary result of that is she's, her body's wasting itself away. So you got to find out what's driving in, in mm -hmm. a treatment situation. I'd want to know what's pushing this. Uh, where, what is this obsessive focus the result of? If she's willing to get treatment and wants to get better. Mm -hmm. uh, but just looking at it externally, you say, oh, anorexia. You can't make the assumption it's a classic case of anorexia. Right. That's true. That's true. But... Yeah. I think I should be looking more. I, I'm just, I was just trying to make this, the point that I and everyone else should be looking more at the people between 55 yes. and 70, because we were in the generation of Twiggy where the, you couldn't be too thin, you know, it can't be too thin or too rich. You couldn't be too thin. And part of how we grew up in our adolescence was that we controlled our food right. and our exercise to make us as thin as you can make yourselves. And I saw pictures from college and I thought I was fat in college. Everybody well, kind of also, had that view. Classically, these girls who become anorexic have very controlling, highly successful fathers. Yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah, so we do. <laughs> but, those, but are, I mean, those are issues. I've dealt with that before. Yeah. I mean, personally and with my friends. And then when you look back, and you see that your swimsuit's falling off of you because right. you're yeah. too thin, then you know that that's something that you, nobody really brought up. You grew out of it because you just had something else to think about. Right. But this is, but we're going to have to look at these people differently who are between 55 and 70 because they went through it before. And I think they're, that we're getting a big bump of it again. Really? Uh, it, as they, lose control of things in their lives. Mm -hmm. They become more controlling Brain about control that. control in narrower and narrower. Yeah. So, so that's kind of a different population we have to start thinking about. And so should our listeners. If they have somebody, they can't just look at somebody and say, well, you're over 50, so you're not going to be anorexic. Right. We kind of assume it's always young people. Yes. So sometimes we just revert to our adolescence as oh, we, we get do. older. Yes. So this is this is one of those things where pellets doesn't fix everything, which I kind of hate to even bring up, but it's true, and you have to well, know that. Well, you don't that. know that it wouldn't fix her if she didn't continue to damage her body. If she oh, well, let her would. body heal, it would do the things it's supposed to right. do. That's but right. But just like not being able to build muscle because of the regimen of mm -hmm. exercise and the lack of food support, mm -hmm. she's wasting her muscle and burning it up. She's mm -hmm. burned up her fat, and now she's burned up her muscles. She continues to do that. No matter how much you put in the tank, there's a hole in the bottom. It just drains right out. Right. 
And I and in most most patients, if they come in and truthfully write down how much they drink, and if they right. drink a twelve pack every night, I don't take them on as patients. Yeah. I mean, that's somebody, that's, that's a different type of problem and I'm not going to make them better and they'll be unhappy. Right. So we ask that question, but if you don't answer it, I well, can't. Well, it's like triage in the emergency room. That's not their most immediate concern. Right. You solve this problem and come back. I can mm -hmm. treat your broken leg, you know. Right. We've got to get your arteries. Stop and that may be some, that, that action of, yeah, you need testosterone, but it's, you're, we're not going to make progress unless you stop doing this. Exactly. Then maybe that will be the trigger that will make them. Look at their problem Hopefully. and actually and that's the next step. They change have to look their behavior yes. because that's the biggest problem with medicine. We can't we can't make a person change their behavior. We can only advise, right? And we can only be the example. Like I can't sit here and gain a hundred pounds and tell you that you should be thin and not eat, or that you should exercise every day. If I don't, or exercise, excuse me, well, every other day. What you can day. say is, is I can tell you, you're going to get worse, you're going to get weaker, you're going to get sicker, and you're going to die. Sooner than you would have. Unless you do something about it. And that's what I will, lead. that's my next step. So everybody learned, including me today. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.